Junko Fruta was like any other teenager. She had dreams, friends, and a family that loved her. She worked hard at school and her part-time job, all while planning for a bright future ahead. But one fateful evening in November 1988, her life took a turn that no one could have ever imagined. Prepare yourself for an emotional and riveting journey into the life of Junko Fruta. This is a story that continues to echo through the years, reminding us of the stark realities of justice and the unyielding power of hope in the face of darkness. Stay with me as I delve into the tale of Junko Fruta. Junko was born on January 18, 1971, in Misato, Sayama Prefecture, Japan. She was known for her bright personality and her strong sense of responsibility. Junko's life was full of dreams and aspirations. She loved spending time with her friends, sharing laughter and making memories. Her family too was a significant part of her life. They cherished her and supported her ambitions. To those who knew her, Junko was a beacon of hope and joy. She had a promising future ahead, filled with the potential to achieve anything she set her mind to. But one fateful evening, November 1988, all of that changed. What began as an ordinary day would soon turn into a nightmare, altering the course of Junko's life forever. It was a typical day in late November 1988. Junko, like any other day, balanced her school and part-time job with determination and optimism. Junko attended her classes at Yashio Minami High School, interacting with friends and participating in lessons. After school, Junko headed to her part-time job at a local plastic molding factory. She had been working there to save money for a special graduation trip. By the time her shift ended, the sun had already set and the streets were starting to quiet down. Junko hopped on her bike, ready to head home and unwind after a long day. But as she made her way home, something unexpected happened. A young boy suddenly appeared and pushed her off her bike. Junko, startled and frightened, found herself on the ground. Her heart racing, the street was nearly empty and no one was around to help. In the midst of her confusion and rising panic, finally a boy appeared. His presence seemed like a lifeline. As he approached with a concerned expression, the boy who had pushed Junko fled the scene. The second boy offered his hand to help Junko up. Relieved and grateful, Junko accepted his assistance, feeling a glimmer of hope in the otherwise terrifying situation. As Junko and the boy worked together, she started to feel more at ease. The boy introduced himself and offered friendly conversation, making Junko believe that she had found a kind stranger in the midst of her ordeal. Still shaken from the initial attack, Junko asked the boy if he could accompany her for a while to make sure the other boy didn't follow her. The boy agreed, seeming more than willing to help. The boy led her down a narrow alleyway, away from the main streets. Before she could react, she realized that they had arrived at an unfamiliar house. Trusting his earlier kindness, Junko followed him inside, hoping to find safety. But as the door closed behind her, she was met with a chilling realization. She was not safe. The boy's demeanor changed abruptly. He was no longer the reassurance presence he had seen. Instead, a sinister smile crept across his face as he revealed his true intentions. The boy who introduced himself as Hiroshi Miyano then sexually assaulted Junko. Miyano then took Junko to a hotel where he assaulted her again. Afterward, he called his friends, proudly recounting what he had done. Joe Goro, one of Miyano's friends, suggested keeping Junko captive until they could all join in. Miyano agreed and took Junko to a park to wait for his friends. Once they arrived, the group Hiroshi Miyano and his accomplices, Nobuharu Minato, Yasushi Watanabe, and Joe Goro took Junko to Minato's house. There, they searched her bag and found her address, using it to threaten her. They pretended to be a members of the Yakuza, a notorious crime syndicate, and told Junko that if she resisted, her family would be killed. Terrified and feeling she had no other choice, Junko compiled their demands. Her ordeal had just begun. After two days, Junko's parents called the police to report her missing. Fearing the increased attention, Hiroshi Miyano, the ringleader, forced Junko to call her parents and tell them she had run away and was staying with friends in an attempt to thwart any search efforts. 
This deception bought the captors more time to carry out their heinous acts without interference. This deceitful act caused the police to stop searching for her. Junko's captivity was marked by relentless physical and psychological abuse. Miyano, Minato, Watanabe, and Oguro subjected her to continuous assaults and unimaginable cruelty. Junko's ordeal included relentless physical torture. She was beaten with iron rolls, burned with cigarettes and lighters, and had her hands and feet crushed by waves. This brutality escalated day by day, with their captors showing no mercy. They also subjected her to inhuman living conditions. Junko was forced to step on a concrete floor, deprived of adequate food and water, and left in her own waste. The psychological torment was just as severe as her captors taunted her and refused to let her connect the outside world. Despite the endless suffering, Junko displayed incredible resilience. She repeatedly tried to escape, but each attempt was met with brutal retaliation. Her captor's cruelty knew no bounds. They hung her from the ceiling and used her as a punching bag, inserted foreign objects into her body, and forced her to eat live cockroaches and drink her own urine. The psychological abuse was relentless. Junko was subjected to verbal humiliation and threats against her family, ensuring she felt isolated and utterly helpless. Her captors even invited other boys from the neighborhood to participate in the abuse, further amplifying her nightmare. During her captivity, Junko's physical condition deteriorated rapidly. She suffered severe injuries including broken bones, internal bleeding, and severe burns. Despite her dire state, they left her in her own waste. Despite her injuries, they refused her any medical treatment, leaving her to suffer unimaginable pain. The boys began to lose interest in Junko as she became weak and her condition worsened. Her body was covered in wounds and she began to emit a foul odor due to infections. They brought in another girl to replace her but Junko's nightmare continued. By the end of her captivity, Junko could no longer move or speak. Her body was covered in wounds and her spirit, while incredibly resilient, was broken by the relentless torture. On January 4, 1989, after losing money in a Mahjong game, Miyano took out his anger on Junko. He spilled lighter fluid on her legs and set her on fire. Despite her desperate attempts to extinguish the flame, the boys continued their assault. They forced her to drink her own urine and burned her with hot wax. Junko convulsed in pain and the boys beat her further, covering their hands with plastic bags to avoid getting her blood on them. After two hours of torture, Junko succumbed to her injuries and died. Fearing arrest, the boys decided to dispose of her body. They wrapped her in a blanket and placed her in a large travel bag, which they then put in a metal drum. They filled the drum with concrete and dumped it in a vacant lot near a construction site in Tokyo's Koto area. You might wonder why did they inflict such unimaginable horror on an innocent girl. The reason is as tragic as it is senseless. Hiroshi Miyano, a notorious school bully known for his connection to the Yakuza, developed a crush on Junko. When he asked her out on a date, Junko, uninterested and wary of his reputation, politely refused. Miyano was enraged, he wasn't used to being rejected, especially after boasting about his powerful and dangerous connections. This rejection wounded his pride and fueled a desire for revenge. A few days after being turned down, Miyano aligned with his friend Nobuharu Minato roamed the streets of Misato with malicious intent. They spotted Junko riding her bike home from work. Acting on Miyano's orders, Minato kicked Junko off her bike. In early 1989, Hiroshi Miyano and Jogoro was arrested on charges unrelated to Junko Furuta. They were being interrogated about the kidnapping and gang rape of another woman. During the interrogation, Miyano mistakenly believed that Ogura had confessed to Junko Furuta's murder and thought the police already knew about it. In a panic, Miyano revealed the location of Junko's body, thinking it would mitigate his situation. The police were initially puzzled by Miyano's confession, as they were not questioning him about Junko Furuta's case. However, they followed up on the information provided, which led to the discovery of Junko's body in the concrete field drum on March 29, 1989. 
The subsequent arrest of Shinji Minato, Yasushi Watanabe and others involved led to a public outcry due to the severity of the crime and the preserved leniency of the sentences given to the perpetrators. Hiroshi Miyano was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Jogoro received a sentence of 5 to 10 years. Shinji Minato was sentenced to 5 to 9 years and Yasushi Watanabe received a sentence of 5 to 7 years. These sentences were considered light by many, sparking widespread debate about the juvenile justice system in Japan. The case of Junko Furuta remains one of the most horrific and heartbreaking crimes in Japanese history, highlighting the need for a stronger protection for victims and more stringent punishments for offenders. We must remember Junko Furuta and countless other victims whose voices were silenced. By sharing her story, we can raise awareness and advocate for justice and strong protection measures for the vulnerable. If you found this story impactful, subscribe to my channel. Your support helped me continue to bring light to important issues. Like and share, ensuring these stories are not forgotten. Engage with me in the comments below. What changes do you believe are necessary to prevent such tragedies in the future? By joining this conversation, you are contributing to a community dedicated to making a difference. Thank you for watching and being part of this crucial dialogue.